Hey, good morning, good morning, Victory. Welcome, welcome to our guests that are here today. We welcome you to Victory Lutheran Church. We are glad you're here and, and part of the family today as you worship with us. Hey, we believe here at Victory that God's word does two works for us. First, it saves us and then it sends us. And we, we believe in that sending that, that we exist to win and grow people in Christ we are zealous to learn God's word better and better and better and better so that we can continue to go and tell people what God has done for them, for us, because God's good word is always moving and active, and it draws us together today. In the book of Psalm, verse 80, chapter 89, verse 1 and 2, it says this, I will sing. Guess what? We got our college praise team. Look at these college students up here. We got our college praise team. They are going to be awesomely leading us in worship today, and you're going to be blessed. And hey, for young folks, we're going to do something for the young folks tonight. College students, young folks, we want to do something special for you uh, tonight at 7. We're going, to have some, we're going to have some snacks. We're going to have some things out on the coffee bar. We're going to have uh, praise and worship here for the college students. We're going to have testimonials. If you, are, if you are of the younger nature and you love to hear some really loud music, great testimonials, and hang out with the college students, don't miss it tonight. This is for those that are in their college age, 20s. Come on out. Be part of it. For us, old, for us a little bit older, we have this morning. And it'll be good. Trust me. It'll be good. And so we're, we're grateful for that. But listen to what God's Word declares through the Psalm 89 I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonders. O oh Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. Father God, we pray this morning as we come into your place of worship, into your holy house, that you would meet us through your word, through your grace, through your resurrection power. Give us, O oh Father, the faith to hear and to see and to believe that which the carnal flesh rejects and denies. Bring us into worship now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we worship the Lord.
Wow, that was awesome. Please be seated. Thank you, praise team. Our scripture reading is taken from 1 John 5, 1 to 5. And as we hear the word, as we read the word, we examine ourselves over the word. It's called the third use of the law. We consider our sin and the struggles of our life. And as I read the words, after we're, I'm done reading, we're going to pray and confess our sin to God. In the midst of us confessing our sin to God, we will trust that the word has done what it says it will do. Listen to what God gives us in 1 John 5, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. His commands, they're not burdensome. For everyone born of God, they overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This morning, I'd love for you to meditate and ponder those powerful words given to us. It is God's will, it is God's longing and desire for you to be brought into, into depth. Every one of us starts out an inch deep and a mile wide shallow Christians. For those that call on the name of Jesus. We all start out shallow, but it's God's desire to take us deep. And that starts with hearing the word and confessing our sin daily, many times a day, and then seeking God and his word and not any other means to deliver us from our struggles. This morning, God is in the business of delivering you. And I would love for you to just, just pause, close your eyes. We're going to corporately do this, but it's, it's kind of individual, but it's corporate because God calls us as a corporate church. The word speaks, and then he gives us faith to cry out. And we start crying out to God here this morning, confessing our sin, crying out to God because our hearts are broken, longing, looking 
needing, whatever's on your heart, whatever heaviness is there, this is your time to be set free so that God can do a deep work with the rest of the service. He's taking you deep. But we don't go deep if we don't confess our sin. That's why it's at the beginning of the service. Let us go to the Lord at this time. Just bow your heads, pray, and talk to God in the way that you talk to God. And confess and cry out to him, talk to God, and ask him for the deliverance that only Jesus can give. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning confessing our sin. Some of us are under heavy burden. We feel such shame and guilt. We wonder, how could God ever can ever forgive me? And Father, you have imparted faith to those that are broken, hopeless, and helpless, that are crying out, that are needy. And in that faith, we've responded by confessing our sin. And now, Father, we cry out, now what? What now? And according to your word, you declare for those that have been faithful and just who have confessed their sins, that you have forgiven them of all of their sins. That you, Father God, have declared them righteous, washed in your blood, new. We receive it. We need it. We need a touch, Father, for those that have been walking with you for many years, but they're just tired. They've been praying for decades to no avail. Same thing. Father, would you refresh your daughter? Would you refresh your son? It doesn't feel like they could even pray one more time. Would you give them a a supernatural word in this service. A prophetic anointing declaring that the Son of God, to the power of his death and resurrection, is with us. Oh, we need you, Jesus. We need your, your grace today to not only hear that we are forgiven, to not only hear that you are walking with us, but we need you to pray for those families that are hurting, for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for the Vern Quam family, mourn the loss of Vern. Pray for other family members that are sitting in this congregation right now that are thinking of a lost one, a mother, a father, an aunt, uncle, a spouse, a child. Lord, their hearts are broken and heavy, and Lord, they need a touch from you right now, right now, in Jesus' name. Father God, we pray for the eternal hope and glory of Christ to carry those that are grieving through the grief to a place of hope so they could see once again the glory of God, knowing that the loved ones that were in Christ are waiting for them.
Father, we pray for our, the weather, our farmers, the harvest. Thank you for the moisture, but Lord, we ask for a successful, complete and full harvest. Let the weather work with our farmers now so that the crop can come off. Protect them. Lord, we pray for our country that's in complete crazy chaos. Oh God, intervene from the highest office down to the lowest office here in our, in our own city. Would you, oh Jesus, intervene and bless? We don't pray for a truth, we pray for the truth to be central in all our country says and does. Pray that you would supernaturally protect our nation and draw every leader into the truth. Help us, oh God. Bless us and bless our nation. Bless our military. Oh God, bless those that work doctors and nurses, and ambulance and police. Oh, Father, bless and protect them. We thank you for so much. We pray this, this morning as we, as we come humbly before you, not only confessing our sin, but praying for the needs of so many, including our nation, that you would use this church, your people, to be filled with your light. Oh, Jesus, send your light. Send your power. Send your anointing onto every boy and girl, man and woman that's hearing this word right now. Fill us with the glorious grace of God. And help us to sing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we respond to God's word.
you, praise team. Great job. Please be seated. Sometimes you wonder, what, um, what happens in the church when I, when I give my tithes and offerings? Well, we take care of the facility. We pay tithes and offerings. Or, or we pay salaries. We pay for ministry expenses. And we take 10% every week. Lynn takes 10% of the gross. And we send it right into the, to the uh, synodical headquarters so that we can plant churches, send missionaries, and run the national synod. Uh, so that we have a place that we can call home. First uh, Corinthians 16.2 says this, On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside, store it up, as he may prosper, so that there is no, collect, no collecting when I come. This is Paul talking, saying that um, he doesn't want you to worry about it when he gets there. He just wants you to have it already set aside one of the things my wife and I did as soon as uh, we got married and learned about the importance of tithing, uh, we just wanted stuff to be taken out of our check before we ever saw it. Therefore, we didn't care uh, about what the check looked like afterwards. And we could use that as fun money to give to the church in a tithe and give to the ministry things as offerings up above a tithe. It was a wonderful opportunity. We still do it to this day. Now, if you're a guest here today, we don't want you to worry about tithes and offerings. We just want you to just receive and be blessed. If you're worshiping here on a regular basis, but you're like, I'm not too sure about tithes and offerings, learn the word, get into the word, watch what God is doing. And when God starts using your life in ministry in some way, you will find that giving to God is more of a get to than a, it is. And it is, uh, that is where uh, tithes and offerings are a blessing for all. And so we want you to uh, watch a, um, a video from our synod talking about a church plant in Bismarck, something that you have already been investing in. Go ahead and hit the... When we think being a part of a church plant, we think of something new, something exciting, where there's an overflow of a desire for a new community to come to know the Lord. Your church operating like that today? Would it be possible for it to return to that passion? Today we're going to hear a story of a church that did just that. Grace for many years has probably been like most churches, where we gather Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, and it's wonderful. It's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's more to being the church than just gathering together as a group of believers. There's more. It's great that we're all here in church, but the mission field is beyond those four walls. In just thinking and praying about uh, uh, going out and reaching out, it has um, it's turned many, many of our people in our congregation uh, just alive. You know, different people have kind of gone off with different projects and, and um, tried to make an impact. It's so friendly at Grace. It feels like you're part of a family. Um, immediately we made friends. Um, we got invited to a group right away and who really brought us in and it was really wonderful. When we started talking about uh, going to a different community, the, the talk was multi-site. Lincoln is about 5,000 people or so right now. We get here. There wasn't a school when we started here. Now we, there's an elementary school, and now it is the largest attended school, elementary school in the Bismarck Public Schools. So this community has young families, lots of kids, which is why we gear much of what we do for kids. When it first started, maybe we had 20, 30 kids on, on a given Wednesday night, and it just, it just multiplied to where we'd easily have 60 kids. With the uh, partnership of North American Mission, we have purchased land in Lincoln, uh, approximately six acres. On that land, we would love to build a building to, to do all this. Volleyball leagues, basketball leagues, whatever. Keep our kids going. And then of course, um, have a, a church where we hold regular worship services, um, reminding people maybe even telling them for the first time that there's a God who loved them, loved them so much that he came to die 
for sinners just like them. You see behind me the overflow of what God has done in Bismarck. Someday in the near future, there will be a community center and a church here. What would overflow look like for you and your congregation? In North American Mission, we'd love to come alongside and partner with you to make revitalization happen in your congregation as well. And if you have the ability, if God has gifted you with financial means to support the planting and the revitalization of churches in North America, please join us as we forge ahead. You know, one of the cool things about what God is and continues to do with, with our church here and the church in general is hunger to see more and more people come to know Jesus in a living way, in a personal way. And one of the things that we as, as leaders here at this very church, uh, the vision that God laid on our, our heart is after the school was developed, after we built a beautiful brand new nearly $3 million church and nearly paid off, thank you, faithful giving uh, generous donors that give to the work of the, the, the church so that the church can be paid off. Guess what? Now we, it doesn't mean we're going to just hire another pastor and find a nice soft cushy bed and go to sleep. No, no, no. Now we start dreaming more. What do we dream of now? Just like what we see happening in Bismarck. Who can we help as the church is, is finished off, paid off? We're going to look for ways to Help others around this community, around this region. What are some churches that we can build up? What, maybe there's a church we could plant in this region. Maybe there are groups that we could send to do different ministries in this region. We want to be a ministering agent in a very similar way that we see so many different churches around. And with, with, with the gift that God's given us in this beautiful facility and with the beautiful school over there, we are seeing opportunities in smaller little towns around here who just don't have the ability to put in a pastor anymore to, uh, to, to minister and to help churches grow and move on. And it is a gift that God's given larger churches to work with smaller communities around them. We have that going on right now. I got some feedback or echo up here, Chase. So anyway, we are, we are looking in the future of ways that this church can be a mission-sending church in Stutzman County. Let us be hungry. This will be the gift that God gives us. And now one of the other things that, uh, that we do as a church is we don't pass the plates. We actually have a basket in the back, and you can drop that basket. You can drop your tithing offering uh, off in the basket as you come in or as you leave. It's marked basket. It's a wicker basket. You can drop them in there. We appreciate it. For those of you that are online, we pray that you would just go to www.findvictory.org. There's a little yellow uh, button on the top right-hand corner. Click on that, and you can give uh, through um, electronic giving, and we appreciate your giving as well for those that watch and uh, we have a pretty good following all over the country for those that watch us online as well. Let me pray for this morning's offering and uh, move on with our service. Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray you bless the tithes and offerings that we receive here today. Lord God, would you use them to generously uh, fan the flame and move the ministry of victory forward in Jamestown and Stutzman County Lord, we, we just pray that we'd be able to knock this debt out so that we could bring on um, more uh, associate pastors, that we could look for opportunities to plant churches and revitalize churches in Stutzman County and to plug into different and new ministries that uh, our people have a vision for doing right here in our body. And so, Lord, thank you for what we see going on at Bismarck, and we pray, God, that you would use this church in that kind of a way to continue to multiply and grow and send disciples, missionaries, and pastors out into the field. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, one of the things about prayer is we don't just pray on Sunday morning in the worship service. Did you know that there is an opportunity for you on Thursdays at one o'clock, there's a group of people that meet here at the church and it's not just for women. It's for men and women. You're invited. 
And we'd love to have you join uh, the prayer time every Thursday here at the church. Let us watch our announcements for Sunday. Go ahead, Kelsey. Good morning. And welcome to your announcements. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, first on the list here, we have the gathering for you guys. Now, this is a cool um, new opportunity that we have at this church where we're going to be bringing in a worship team from the college, which include Renee and I, and the people that you'll see on the stage uh, today for worship. And we're just going to be jamming out. We're going to be doing some worship, and then there will be some testimonies. So make sure to mark your calendar for that one tonight at 7 o'clock. Yeah, and... We're going to take a walk all the way across the narthex to see these cool shirts. So we're going to have new Victory apparel with the new Victory logo. Um, if you are at all interested, come see this table after church today and ask um, the ladies who will be here any questions that you have. It's going to be some pretty sweet shirts to wear. So. Now we have coming up Trunk or Treat. This is a huge thing for Victory Lutheran Church here. And I see a lot of names signed up on here right now, but that's not good enough. We need enough cards to cover at least like 700 kids is what we had last year. So we need you to sign up for Trunk or Treat to help those kiddos. Yeah. And last but not least, we're going to continue walking around the North X all the way over here. There will be a women's gathering on Tuesday, November 2nd from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Don't worry, not in the morning. So if you are a lady who wants to gather with other ladies, mark your calendars for that. It'll be a fun time. Cool. I'm gonna make that funny now. Awesome job. Thank you, Winston and Renee. And aren't, aren't college students refreshing to have in a church? What a gift. We are grateful for Winston and Renee. We're grateful for our new beautiful piano player and drummer from the college. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Oh, hold on. Luke. Luke and Nathan, right? Yes, 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 yes. I had to memory stack because it's like, it's like my kids' names. Go back to my kids. Oh, yeah, who are my kids again? Well, I got one here, Ethan and Levi. and Oh, yes, all good. We are so grateful for all that God is doing and for all of the gifts that God gives us through the work that Winston and Renee are doing. This morning, she was busy teaching the high school students up here doing praise and worship. And now, how does your husband do it again? It's time for... Yay, King's Kids, pre-K to second grade, you are dismissed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pre-K to second grade, you are dismissed for King's Kids. Have fun. There's lots of good things going on. Any parent that ever wants to just join them, you're welcome to. There's, uh, yeah. No moratorium. We could have many parents if you wanted back there. That's, that's always good. We have confirmation students back there helping. It's, it's a gift. And it gets a little bit quieter in here. And we are going to dig into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, please turn your Bible to Matthew 28, 1 to 6. Reading in Jesus' name. When the woman came to the tomb looking for... Whoop. Whoop. I got to do this again. After the Sabbath, at... Dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went looking at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was lightning and his clothes were like white as snow. The, guard, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They literally fainted. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Father God, we pray that you would bless the hearing of this word. 
and the proclamation of the gospel through this. In Jesus' name, amen. So the women, they come early in that morning. And as they come to the tomb, they're coming to, with the spices, they know he's probably, there could, could be a stench already. They're looking for the body, greeted by the angels. The first thing the angels say to the women is, do not be afraid. The angel said, for we know that you are seeking Christ who was crucified. It's not here, he's risen. And then the angel does something really kind of crazy, which sets the, the tone of this whole message. And that is, come see the place where he was laid. So the women go in, they, they look where the body had been, but there's nothing there. There was a place, but there was no person. Uh, there was a grave, but there was no Lord who died on the cross. You remember Luke 24, 24, the road to Emmaus, when the men were walking and talking, and they were talking about the things that were, that were uh, spoken of, of the women. And it says, but him, Jesus, they did not see. John 20, verse 9, they see when there's nothing to see. John answered, when the disciples came into the tomb, who came to the tomb first, the first disciple that went in, he saw and he believed. But what he saw was nothing. The Bible says he saw nothing. And he believed. Believed what? He believed in the power of the resurrection because the word had been planted in them and they had come and they had watched this whole thing unfold and they saw nothing and they believed. They saw nothing and they believed in the power of the resurrection. This morning I want you to watch a video. Last week we would have had Teen Challenge here. But I want, to wa I want you to watch a video of a, a few testimonies of people's lives that were changed when their whole life they saw nothing, but when they hit bottom, they believed. Go ahead, Kelsey. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this video and to be preparing your heart to give to Adult and Teen Challenge. We see every day the struggles that our students face, the addictions and the, the trauma that they have been through. And because of your love and your prayers, you're giving hope to many people, not only in your church, but also here at North Dakota Adult and Teen Challenge by helping to sponsor students, by helping to donate to Teen Challenge. Thank you so much. Thank you for your heart of gold, because it is from God that you are giving the very best. Before coming back to Jesus and coming to North Dakota Adult and Teen Challenge, I possessed a very hard heart. Now God is healing my heart and softening my heart. He is changing the desires of my heart. He is changing my thoughts, my words, my actions, and my attitude. God has mended my relationships with my family. Most importantly, I have an intimate relationship with my Heavenly Father that grows more and more every day, and I know who I am in Him. I am His beautiful daughter. I am forgiven and loved, and I am significant. Each student will complete a set of contracts designed for their specific needs. Each student will receive confidential biblical counseling and learn new ways of coping with the hard times in life. Our choir gives students the experience of performing as a team and then enjoying the feeling that comes when everyone has worked hard to achieve a goal together. Students are given time to learn how to enjoy free time and wholesome activities, to learn how to grow as a person in various non-structured settings. I struggle with drug addiction since I was about 13 years old and alcoholism. In 2014, I ended up paralyzing my my buddy in a rollover, alcohol-related car accident. This last DUI, I got an opportunity to come to Teen Challenge. 
and it's the only time I've ever got a blessing out of the deal. Since I've been at Teen Challenge, God has just been touching my heart left and right. It is absolutely mind-blowing what he's doing in my life. And I was so broken, I didn't think that I was worthy of it. This program has opened my eyes to just a, a new way of life, the only way of life. I don't have the funds to pay for my programming. And they don't turn people away here that don't have the money. They still accept you. It's such a wonderful thing for me personally. I'm just grateful that people donate and help support this program. Besides helping our students to experience a heart change and behavioral change, we also want to empower them to leave North Dakota Adult and Teen Challenge with new or improved vocational skills, valuable life skills, and healthy work ethics. I thought my life was over. I was ch checking out because I didn't want to make my mom cry no more, hurt my family no more. I didn't want to hurt no more. I never thought I could be sober. I thought this was a fairy tale. Since I came to North Dakota and Dalton Teen Challenge, I found who I, who I am. I'm not just a mechanic or a drug addict or whatever. I'm a child of God, I'm a saint. I am loved by the King. I uh, get to help and give back to the guys that come here. We work on cars, we uh, teach them a skill. We love them. We just love everybody. And that's what's so great about this place is that they don't discriminate if you got money or, or how, how hurt you are. You know, it's just like Jesus, you are welcome here. We can't do this alone. It's too big. And there are so many hurting people. Here's where you come in. I was saving this video for this message because it took these individuals on the screen to be absolutely demolished and broken into nothing. They had nothing left. And somewhere along the line, somebody heard about North Dakota Teen Challenge and asked if they could go and would go. And by the grace of God, they ended up there. And when they ended up in this place where the Word of God was faithfully taught and preached, these kids, men, women, started to hear themselves saved, started to believe that they are children of God, started to understand that God was drawing them out of something dark and putting them into the light of God. God was doing the work for them. And this morning, this beautiful picture of how God delivers people from darkness into light is, a, is, is how God would want you to see that you are no different than these people up on the screen and that they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the only way for you to be free of some of the addictions that are holding you down right now is for you to understand that when you see nothing, that's when you are close to being liberated and set free because the power of the resurrection is for the hopeless and helpless bringing them up to the hope of the glory of God. Now when we see that God is, is working here, we see that he proves a fact, he proclaims forgiveness, and he provides a force which we dealt with last week. So first of all, I want us to take a look at how God proves the fact. We see that God proves the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. How? Well, by declaring to be the Son of God with the power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1.4. God allows them to see and prove the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, does this mean he's just a son and he's not God? No. It means that he's one in the Trinity and you got Father God you got the Son of God, and you got the Holy Spirit. They are three separate individuals, but they're one in nature, in essence, that Jesus is God. He's one with the Father. And through the, 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 the nothingness that they were seeing, the word that had been planted into them sprouted, and they saw the power of the resurrection to help them step through their their, their hurts and pains through their denials to be liberated from themselves, from the sin that grips them day in and day out. 
I don't know about you, but I've noticed that my flesh will not stop trying to prove that Jesus is not the Son of God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you saying, Reverend? What are you saying, Pastor? Saying that your three greatest enemies are your flesh, the world, and the devil, and your flesh is always fighting against you to prove that Jesus is not the Son of God. Say, could you prove that to me? Yeah, well, let's just take a look at the word itself. In the word, we see that we all doubt like Thomas. Got any doubters in here? You know, we, we hear the word of God. We think about the word of God. We look at the situations of life. We look at, our own, we look at our own struggles, and we start to doubt. We doubt our husband. We doubt our wife. We doubt our children. We doubt the church. We doubt our pastor. We doubt our godly friends. We start doubting everything. You see, our flesh wants to prove that Jesus is not the Son of God because our flesh was born into wickedness. And it's always fighting against the good work that Jesus did in his death and resurrection. But don't worry, God is bringing you to the empty tomb to show you that we are nothing. And in your nothingness, he shows you the resurrection and the power that you have in Jesus. Not only do we doubt like Thomas, but we fight like the sons of thunder. Listen to how we fight. And we go against the people that we love most. Warring against each other in spirit, mind, and soul. Sitting and thinking and hatching plans about what I think they're thinking this about me. How about just going to them and asking them what they think? No, no, North Dakota nice. We'd rather sit and think about what we think they're thinking about us. Then we, then we brew up some goofy conspiracy theory about how certain someone's thinking. And then when it finally comes out, you were wrong. 99% of the time I have found I'm wrong. My wife always reminds me of that, by the way. And so there's no use sitting and hatching. Just drop the hatching where you're thinking about, I think I know what so-and-so is thinking, and just go to him and say, can I ask you a question? Are you angry with me? Are you disappointed with me? Did I say something to offend you? Oh, no, 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 no. It was this. It was that. Oh, well, I would have probably sat and brewed on that for, for two, three, four, five, six months because they looked at me wrong. And I feared that I did something to offend them. So I must have did something. You know, I'm speaking right to you. Unless that never happens to you. We are the sons of thunder. We lie to ourselves. We deny like Peter. You remember Peter? Well, Jesus, well, I, I don't know anything about Jesus. We live in a constant state of, of, of lying and denying that, that, that we are who God says we are. You know, not me, Pastor. Really? Well, if, if you were to stand up and say, you know, I don't agree with what you just said or I don't agree with this, this ideology that's being spoken of here because it doesn't align with the Word of God and the Word of God is my source of normal life, therefore I must trust what God's Word has given me and I'm, a, I'm standing against this, well, this could cost me a friend, my job, could cost me my position, my place on this board. I don't want to do these things because it could cost me. So what do we do? We live like Peter and we deny him and we like to do what the rest of the disciples did. What did they do? Well, when the rubber met the road, the other disciples ran and hid. They'd rather not be known as a religious zealot for Jesus. No, 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 no. We want to be more of the laid back, calm Christians uh, that get along. And we're, we, we, we win people by our love. Well, that's how one could look at it. But God's word never changes. In fact, it keeps confronting you over and over and over again until it breaks you. It breaks your rebellious spirit. So I don't have a rebellious spirit, really. I remember when my kids were little and I would say, now, don't wear this or don't do this. Don't brush your teeth with this toothbrush or use this toothpaste or don't put these pair of shorts on anymore. They, they, they're... they're you know, too little for you. Well, so then they put them on and then they put their, sh and they're like, <laughs> I got them. Or I'm using my favorite toothbrush that dad threw in the garbage. Or I'm, do you know, there's, there's always this rebellious spirit that says, even though you said I shouldn't do this, when you're not looking, I'm going to do it. That's the flesh fighting against the will of God and the love of God saying, 
I doubt that Jesus is who he says he is because if he we really believed it, there would be a willingness to live in obedience. Amen? And so we see our disobedience, we see our nature and, and, and our spirit to push back against the things of God, and God continues in his love to show himself alive to you and to his apostles after his death <clears throat> with many infallible words. Look at Acts 1-3. He presented himself alive after his suffering. <clears throat> Jesus is in the business <clears throat> of showing himself alive to you. He's in the business of giving you the understanding that he is omnipotent, omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He hears every thought you, you said. He is everywhere. And in the midst of God's everywhereness, he in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, wants you to see the resurrected Christ is a fundamental fact that we keep in mind so that we know that we are saved by grace and not by works, if you keep in memory what I have preached to you. Paul wants us not to forget what he gave us. You see, the first sermon under the Great Commission was almost entirely devoted to the preaching of the resurrection. Take a look at Acts chapter 2, 22 through 36. Look at verse 24. God raised up. Verse 30, raised up in Christ. Verse 31, the resurrection of Christ. Verse 32, this Jesus, this Jesus God raised up. The entire book of Acts is a sermon about the resurrection of Christ. Why? Because it all revolves around what God has done in the tomb. So that you can come to the tomb and see nothingness. And the seeds that were planted in you will sprout. And you will believe in the power of the resurrection. Billy Graham, when he was a young new preacher was preaching and his venues were growing, growing. He finally got to preach in this huge arena called the Rose Bowl. And as he was preaching, he gave an altar call and guess how many people came forward? None. And he's back in his room feeling dejected and rejected and sad, sitting in his chair, can't believe it. God, why did you call me to be an evangelist just to shame me? I call people to Christ and not one person came forward. And all of a sudden, as he's sitting there crying to himself, Billy hears this. He goes to the door and he opens it. There stands this little old shriveled up man in his 80s following Jesus for many, many, many decades who loved God. And he said, young man, can I ask you a question? Billy Graham said, yes. He said, would you like to know why nobody came forward in your sermon tonight? Billy Graham said, yeah, I would. I'm sitting here right now trying to figure out why nobody came forward. And he said, nobody came forward today because you didn't preach the resurrection. And the resurrection is where the power comes and until they hear the resurrection, they're not going to hear themselves saved. And so, Billy Graham learned and he said in his book, never again did I preach a sermon. Never again did I preach a sermon where I didn't mention the resurrection. You see, the resurrection is vital to everything. Our very salvation depends on the resurrection our very salvation depends on the faith that comes through this resurrection. That begins uh, by God giving us this faith and in this resurrection power we see in Romans 10, 9. How we react and respond to this is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, everything revolves around the resurrection. If you're going to be saved, it's through the resurrection. If you're going to be saved, it's by confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart. My dear friends, the power of God, it starts with the word and it ends with the word. Look at the word working through all of the things that we do within the church. We preach the word every Sunday. Once a month we give baptism. Every now and then I, 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 have, a I have a baptism, we have communion. Everything revolves around the word of God and resurrection. 
Look at 1 Peter 3.21. Peter said this. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not a removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge of good conscience towards God. It saves you. Read it with me. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, my dear friends. It's not about the little sprinkle of water. It's not if you got baptized in a lake. It's not if you got baptized here. It's about knowing that baptism revol revolves around the, re the, the, uh, the resurrection. And if you understand that the, that, that the resurrection is not only found in baptism, it's found in communion, it's found in the word, it gives you the faith to see that my sinful condition has brought me to the place where I see nothing in myself, but I see everything in Christ. Therefore, my, my hope is found in Christ who rose again for a hopeless, helpless sinner. And that is me. I've often thought to myself, instead of calling it baptism, maybe they should have called it resurrection water. And there wouldn't be so much fighting about baptism. It's about, bapti it's about the resurrection. Everything revolves around the resurrection. And finally, second point, I want to say this. We see that the power of the resurrection proclaims our forgiveness. Not only do we see that God proves the fact that Jesus is his son, but he also proclaims our forgiveness through Jesus. Acts 13, 37, and 39. It's this resurrection power that gives us the vision of what God has done. But when we look at Jesus, we see, look at Acts 13, 37. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you you could not be justified from the law of Moses. In other words, it's through that New Testament work of Jesus' work of death and resurrection that we find the grace and mercy of God, not through the law of Moses, but through the work of God. In Romans 4.25, he was raised because of our need for justification. Listen to this. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life, read it with me, for our justification. You are justified because of Christ's death and resurrection. You get to see nothing in the empty tomb of your works, of your, of, your, of, your, of your efforts. And you get to believe on the promises that have been sown into you, uh, starting in, in as far back as your baptism, in communion, in the word, in Sunday school, as mommy and daddy faithfully followed through on their vow to say that they would teach the word of God to their little ones that were baptized, or maybe you were baptized as an adult. You continue to read the word of God. I know a lot of people who are baptized as an adult that never continued on in the word. And guess what? It died. The word will die in those who are baptized and don't follow the word of God. It'll die. So when you are in the word and following the word, the word gets you, it saves you, it renews you. He died and was raised and makes for you intercession. Look at Romans 8.34. It says, he, who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised and is at the right hand of God and also is now interceding for you. Hebrews 7 25. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is a God who we learn through the death and resurrection is constantly interceding for us. I said in the first service that uh, there are times when I'm so dumbfounded with issues in life. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray for me, my kids, my wife, my church. I don't know how to pray for situations. And I will just say, Jesus, you said in your word that you would intercede for me. And I'm going to just focus on the cross, focus on the resurrection, focus on the goodness of, of your love for, for me and for your people. And I'm going to trust that you will intercede right now for this situation. And you can take it to the bank. Jesus' intercessory prayer is going to be a lot better than your prayer, no matter how you do it. God uh, intercedes for us. And we are to preach Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. And when you start talking about the resurrection, it becomes a stumbling block. And so uh, I would encourage you to not 
veer away, but stand on the resurrection, knowing that the stumbling block is going to cause people to peer in and see the empty tomb, and it's going to be the Coram Deo of God, the, the, the mirror of God, where they're seeing back their own wicked condition, and then looking back to the word of God and promise, and believing that the promise has delivered and saved me, not because of any good thing I've done, but because of Christ. You see, we preach Christ crucified. He became for us the righteous Righteousness, the sanctification and redemption, according to 1 Corinthians 1.30, is because of him that you are in Christ. It is because of him that, that, that God has given you the wisdom to follow God and trust God. As I said, he is your source and norm of life. He is the righteousness, holiness, and redemption that has been given to you through his death and resurrection. The Christians in the New Testament emphasized Christ and what he has done. They lived in it. They they proclaimed it. They, they took Holy Communion around it. They preached the word around it. They had baptism around it. It was always about the resurrection. And much of our preaching today, my dear brothers and sisters, emphasizes how to respond, but hardly mentions Christ and the sin offering he had. Therefore, leaves out the resurrection. This is why we have churches that are empty, churches that are veering away from the word of God, churches that no longer believe in the inerrant and fallible word of God because they would rather give you a list of, 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 of converts, people converted to a system rather than a savior, rules rather than a redeemer, a plan rather than a man, Jesus Christ. And so there's, there's a great desire for, for, for people to be in country clubs and not in hospitals where they're dealing with your sin on a daily basis. And churches that don't deal with sin and won't preach the resurrection are not lead, leading people to salvation and hope in Christ in heaven, but they're leading them to an eternal damnation in hell. And that needs to be called out by God's people who are standing firm on God's word. You see, his death, burial, and resurrection for our sins is living in and through you. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. My brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Notice, if you hold firmly, don't let the world suck you under. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as the first importance, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to scripture. Everywhere you look in the New Testament, it's resurrection, resurrection, resurrection. All of Acts, Acts chapter 2, 3, 7, 8, 10, 16, 17, 20, 23, 26, and 28. All those chapters are dealing with resurrection. The whole book of Acts is a, is, a, is a sermon about the resurrection. And if we preach the resurrection, if they preached about faith, it's only as it related to Christ. Listen to Acts chapter 16, verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. What does that mean? The household taught the resurrection to the wee littlest of children. We have been called by God to teach our family, teach our kids, teach our, 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 our grandkids about the resurrected Christ and what he did for their sin and their sin. And this is what we are called to do. You see, if they preach confession, it was a confession to Christ. Romans 10, 9 through 10, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And they preached the word of God. They preached and taught the word of God. Therefore, we find our obedience is a result of Jesus' total commitment to sacrifice as the offering for sin. That's when we see our weakness, our worthlessness, our uselessness. We see our vanity and our vain. And in the, in the vanity, no matter what we do or how many times we do it, we see the work of God, and when we see the work of God, we see the emptiness of all the things that we've tried to give to God, and we see the resurrected promise that was sown into you through the word, and we believe in the power of the resurrection. And we are converted from darkness to light because my brothers and sisters, the word of God has been planted in you. And God sees you as a child of God. He sees you as a forgiven 
child of God. He sees you as a son and a daughter, a prince and a princess. And you find yourself, as it says in Philippians 3.10, I'm going to land it here. You find yourself, come on up praise team. You find yourself in Philippians 3.10, Hearing and believing this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Notice Paul is longing for two things. Write this down. Don't miss this confirmation, student. Paul is longing for one, a personal experience with Christ. Note that he said that I might know him. This isn't a religious experience. It's a personal experience. Have you had a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Because if you haven't, here's what you do. You cry out to God and you say, God, forgive me of my sin. I long to know you personally right now. Just start saying it. And secondly, we see the powerful experience with Christ. Note this, that I might know him, and, and, and it says, and the power of his resurrection. You see, the key to being set free in your, in your forgiveness is to tell others about the resurrection. That is what he wanted to know, to realize, to comprehend, to grasp. Paul wanted to know the power that was available to him through the resurrected Christ. And Ephesians 1, 18 and 20 says this. Paul prayed that the Ephesians might know what is, exceeding, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This morning as you leave this place, what do you see when you look at a world that's broken, when you look at families that are broken, when you look at your own situations and conditions and you know the sin that you wish you could just get rid of is a trap that keeps drawing you in and in and in and in and in. What do you see but nothingness, hopelessness? What do you see? God says, look again. For my son has been planted in you. Look at the power of his resurrection. You are going to see that God proves the fact that he is Christ. He died for you and he lives in you. You are going to see the proclamation of the forgiveness that is now yours. And you're going to find that your response to that forgiveness is yours. You can, you can start to ask God to forgive you right now. Go ahead and just start playing the piano right now. There you go. You're going to understand that he provides a force in your life that you can live by. This is called sanctification. And in your daily walk, you're going to look forward to confessing your sin instead of running away from your sin. This is the power of the resurrected. When you see nothing, you see Christ. This is the living Lord that Paul was talking about when he said, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. Do you need the resurrected Lord? Do you need him to stand next to you and strengthen you right now? Then just ask him. Just ask him. He died and rose again so that you could know that he's standing next to you. You see, his resurrection was and is designed to provide the personal touch of a living and active Lord in your life. A touch designed to cause you to trust him the one who said, Revelation 1, 17 and 18, I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am alive in you. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's sing.
God has been speaking to your heart and working on you, I would just encourage you, you can do this in your mind with your hands or you can actually physically do it, but you know when you put oil into your car, you put a funnel in and it it pours in and and I'm going to speak a blessing on you and just receive it. Lift up your hands and say, God, I need this filling and know that God through this promise, this benediction is sealing what he started in you through this message today. And may the hope of God fill you with every joy. May the peace of God fill you with the peace of Christ as you trust in him so that you, child of the living God, may overflow with the hope by the power of the resurrection through the Holy Spirit. And may Jesus bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and may he be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and may the Lord give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may you leave this place sealed in the triune's promise knowing that he's done all that needs to be done for you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Let's sing the doxology together.